glory. Let me extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you on this bright, I say bright, even though it's a bit rainy outside. Amen. Bright morning because why? It's bright whenever God is. Amen. Amen. Okay, for this morning, we want to turn to a scripture. I'm looking at John chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to me, John chapter 4. And I'm going to read from verse 21 to 24. John chapter 4, 21. And Jesus said unto her, Are you all there yet? Amen. Okay. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. For God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. May the Lord just bless the reading of His Word. Amen. You know, when I read this, and every time I read this, it reminds me this is perhaps one of the greatest moments. I use the word greatest moments in the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this background to this, Jesus was coming back into Galilee. And in between from Judea to Galilee, there was this province or this area called Samaria. Now the traditional Jews, wherever they want to go through, they would go, rather go around Samaria. They would not want to go through Samaria. Because to them, the Samaritans were a people that were despised by them. Despised not because they are impure, yes, some Jews would say, oh, they had intermarried with people from Mesopotamia, they had intermarried with people from Syria, and therefore they were not pure, but reality it was not that as a reason. But the main reason was a dispute among them as to where true worship really takes place. And this was a point of contention, because the Samaritans believe that worship happens on the Mount Gerizim, and that was their focus on where worship should be. Whereas the Jews believe that true worship only happens in a temple at Jerusalem. And so they regarded the, the uh, Samaritans more like cows. <laughs> Amen. So here we see this conversation. And Jesus chose to go true, right true, to true Samaria. And he came to this well, Jacob's well at Sychar, there's a city there. And it was noon time. Time where there's the heat of the day is already up. Time where there will be not many people at the well because the ladies will usually come out to get, draw water, to you know, do the necessary, like washing clothes with the water and all. And they would do it early morning. Nobody would go to a well right in the middle of the day. But how many know that Jesus never did anything by accident? He did it by divine, I believe, revelation. And so he came to this well, and he was sitting by the well. His disciples decided to leave him to go in the city to try and buy some food and everything. But he told them, go. But he sat there. How many know that he was waiting for someone? Amen. I want to tell you this. God has a divine appointment for each and every one. God knows us from the very hairs that's on our head, right down to every part of us. And he was waiting. And here comes, in the heat of the day, noontime, where people already have gone back to their homes, a Samaritan woman. This Samaritan woman it was not only, the Jews would say, an unclean person, but she was also an outcast, even among the Samaritans. Why was she an outcast? Well, she was not uh, welcome to be with other women because the other women perhaps had considered her a very immoral woman. Jealous. Well, <laughs> jealous of immorality, I hope not. <laughs> but she came and she was there when, Je 
when Jesus actually engages her in conversation. Something that no Jewish man would do. Definitely not even a rabbi or a teacher. To engage with an unclean person, engage with a woman, engage with somebody who's an outcast among the outcasts. Well, interesting. As Jesus begins to talk to her, the background is, she tries to avoid, she tries to bring the whole conversation, you know, trying to avoid what Jesus is trying to say to her with what I would call very flippant and very sarcastic answers. You know, and despite this something, Jesus knows her sin. And if you read that, you'll see this. And he even asks her, you know, where's your husband? <laughs> and when she answered, he said, yeah, yeah, you're right. You say you've got no husband, you're right, because the one you're living with now is not your husband. But let me tell you, you've got so many other husbands before that. Wow. So, despite no matter sins, he starts to encourage her with the love of God. And the result, we see this, that the encounter breaks her heart and she begins to run back into the city to begin to proclaim that the Messiah they've been waiting for has come. Amen? And in all this encounter too, there was lessons for the disciples as well. But let's look now in some more detail. What did Jesus mean in John chapter 4? The few verses we read. Firstly, there's a lesson to be learned because this is part of Jesus' correction. Not on a woman's morals, but on the meaning of worship. And something for us to understand, to learn. Okay, remember I said, here comes a woman trying to distract conversation about her sin. Asking questions to resolve the old spiritual contention. Where is true worship? On Mount Gerizim or on Jerusalem, the temple. So what did Jesus clarify? He clarifies that real worship is not about a location. Sometimes, even in the modern context, we believe that true worship only is in certain church or in certain denominations or at certain places. You know, there are people who are Christians who believe that they must go to somewhere where there's something iconic or some statue or whatever it is or a certain place, you know, and you go there to worship. That's true worship. No. She just said, worship is not about a place, not about a location. It's about what is the intent of your heart. So first lesson for us to learn here in this whole conversation is about the need to search our hearts even as we want to worship God. Amen? The second thing is this. The second lesson I picked up from here is about Jesus showing the extent of God's love. God's love that looks beyond our faults. God's love that looks beyond our weaknesses. God's love that looks beyond our shortcomings. God's love who does not look at us as people who are so far away from Him in sin. But God's love seeing a hope and a future for each and every one who would turn away from their sins. This woman, as we just now just talked, and you can see this in earlier verses 16 to 18. I didn't read it, but you can go back and read it. That this woman has lived a very, very deeply immoral lifestyle. Why? We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us exactly. So you can see this, what I mentioned just now. An outcast from the people that were treated as outcasts. But why this conversation? You notice the way Jesus talked to her. Many of us, we need to know something. And Jesus is trying to show her that she is wanted, she is valued, and she is loved. Do you know something? That's the greatest love of God. A God that looks beyond our shortcomings, our faults. A God that wants to show His love for God so loved that He even sent His only begotten. Yes, to die. Why? He wants to restore us to understand the value. 
You know, a lot of times when you live in this world with all these struggles, we may not even understand the value of ourselves. Often we undervalue ourselves and people around us may despise and undervalue us. But I tell you this, the lesson I learned from here is God has put a value on your life, my life, each and every life. And that value is the value of the life of His Son, Jesus Christ. That when we're yet sinners, Christ will come and die for us. So, you know, as I read this, I understood something. If we would but be open, Jesus wants to meet us at the exact point of our need. What is our need? Well, I believe this woman has been trying to quench a spiritual thirst within her. And many of us sometimes do the same. There are things we cannot understand. So we try to fill ourselves with worldly things. We try to fill ourselves like this woman, perhaps with worldly lust. Maybe she thought she could find a meaning and significance in her life just by multiple relationships. And when she could not find it, she went to another one. She could not find it, she went to another one. But what Jesus is trying to show her, that physical things does not satisfy. You can drink of the water from the well, but yet it would not satisfy. It can slate your thirst for a minute, but it would not satisfy the deep thirst. And he tried to bring her back to this in John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. He began to talk about it. That what you really need to satisfy, that thirst and the desire of the things of the world is actually a spiritual living water Amen. that can quench that spiritual thirst. And as your spiritual thirst is quenched, so will your spiritual, your natural thirst, your natural needs, your natural perspectives, your natural way of looking at things would also change. She needed to understand that she need not look any further. That here, standing in front of her, Jesus said, I can give you water they can drink, that you, can, you need thirst no more. But there was also a lesson in this. As I read this, as meditated, and the lesson the Lord spoke to me is this, that there is a need to humble oneself. You can have the Messiah right in front of you. You can have Jesus even today in front of you. But you will never recognize until you humble yourself to understand that you have a need. A lot of times we can cloud ourselves with so much busyness. We can cloud ourselves with so much distraction. We can cloud ourselves with not only distraction, attractions that we can miss the very mark of our need itself. What is that real need that's within you? Do you look for things that do not satisfy? And this perhaps is another important thing. You know, it reminded me of the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a man of position. He was a ruler, a religious ruler, a member of the Sanhedrin. But you see, no matter of his own self-esteem, his own one, he realized he had a need. Why did he come to Jesus in the night? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say so. Maybe he didn't want to be embarrassed. <coughs> but yet, he came. <coughs> and this is perhaps one of the most important things we've got to ask ourselves. Do we recognize that we have the need or have we clothed ourselves with such pride, arrogance? We clothe ourselves with even our past experiences and knowledge and things like that and think that we don't have a need. Sometimes we got to relook. It is our past experiences, the knowledge acquired that can become mindsets. Yes, I had the same problem. Mindsets. And we can think that we are self-sufficient. We can take heart in our earthly possessions. And we can think that it's a strength of our arm that got us what we have. You know, the word of Scripture always reminds me in Second Chronicles, 
chapter 7, verse 14. And here the Lord says this, if my people who are called by my name. Remember, he's speaking to believers. Will first humble themselves. And not only pray, but as you pray, seek my face. And even as you seek God's face, he says what? Turn from the wicked ways. Because everything that we've built around us, the ways, the things we think, even our past experiences, our past teachings and everything, can be obstacles for us to really encounter and see the face of God. Turn for our wicked ways. Then God is going to hear from heaven. God is not only going to forgive the sins, but God will heal the land and your need will be no more. You know, as I really struggle on these things here, there's so much lessons. But the third lesson I saw was what I want to focus on today. It is about a coming of a season. The very words Jesus said is, but the hour cometh. And now is. Did it happen then? No, Jesus is saying, now is the hour that's of something that's going to happen. And you know, sometimes we may not understand this. But this hour that comes, it involves a few things as I study the word. One, it involves people who will be true worshippers. Now, if there's a word true, then there can be untrue worshippers, isn't it? Right? As there's a word good, there can be bad. Means there are some of us may be worshippers who may not be true worshippers. That's the first thing that hit me. I said, God, what did I say? I've been worshipping you. But again, remember Jesus trying to tell a woman, when you come to worship God, it's not about a place. It's not about even who you're worshipping. Yes, it is. It's about the intent of your heart. And true worshippers, that's one of the things said. And the true worshippers only come that this worship, these true worshippers are people who will be worshipping in spirit and in truth. That's the second dimension. Because a lot of times we do things that we worship with our flesh. Here, notice the word, the word spirit is not capital S, it's a small S if you look at the Bible. He's talking about not the spirit of God that will lead us, it's about the spirit of man. And this is so important. Because in fact, many of us, we can be born again today believing in Jesus with our spirit man alive, but yet our flesh can dominate us. Oh yes, oh yes, people say, no, no, pastor, I've been saved. True. But if you go to Galatians chapter 5, there's a very good checklist of the works of the flesh. And you start to take off, wow, anger, hmm, this, this. Then you know, are you really in spirit or are you in flesh? I'll talk more about this next week, about how we really must understand what is called for us to be in the dimension of the spirit and not the flesh. Okay, just a hint. Romans 8.1 tells us, therefore now there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But yet it says, walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Amen. I'll talk more next week. But this is true now. And the third revelation in this coming season, which hit me, is not about us seeking God. It's about the Father who seeketh such would you like that? It's not about you seeking God. It's about God seeking you. You know, I never understood this until the time I got saved. I always thought I was a Christian. I was born in a Christian family. Even though I backslided the world and there was nothing Christian in my life, I still at one time went to church every Sunday. It's like the more I go to church, I exchange, I put a halo on, you know. And all of a sudden, you become very holy. The more I sat, step out of church, it's like I took the halo off. I got the car to drive off very soon, like little horns appeared. <laughs> and many of us can live this double, not a double-aged sword life, but a double life. I, I'm only talking about myself, amen. <laughs> but 
this is certain realities. So long as we are in the flesh, can we really be true to what God wants us to be? So let's talk about this coming season. Try to understand why there's a need for a new season. In a new season, as I deliberated, a few things came clear to me. One, God was going to establish a new covenant, a better covenant, a covenant that's yet built on the old, but a covenant that will bring us into a new dimension of relationship where the word faith becomes part of our relationship with God. Now, you heard me teach this before. Then the Old Testament, the word faith, as we know in the New Testament, did not exist. The word faith only existed in the New Testament. The New Testament faith comes from what? Romans 10, 17. Hearing. And hearing from the very rhema of God. But, important, you cannot hear if you're not in a relationship with God. Let me repeat this. You cannot hear if you're not in a relationship with God. We must understand what has happened. Why there was a need for a new season, a new covenant, a new and better era to come. You see, the word sin, the word sin, and I'll talk about it in a minute. But this new season was also about the gift of the Holy Spirit that was to be given. It was about a promise of the Father that was to be realized. It's about the stage that has been set for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand that first in creation, man was made perfect. Adam was made without sin. He was created without sin. And the Lord set a pattern in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24, 25, you understand that whatever was created by God was reproducing after the way it was created. So before the fall, man reproduced without sin. But after the fall, what happened? The reproduction formula is still the same. But because sin, what is sin? Sin is not just about doing wrong. Sin is about something that's happened that separates man from God. So something happened and man is separated and now man began to reproduce in sin. Perhaps then you can understand why Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, for all have sinned, irrespective, even if you think you did not do anything wrong, for you have sinned too because you are being reproduced from the line of man that started with the creation of Adam. So look at somebody. <laughs> All have sinned, without exception. But this coming a new season. The separation of God was about to be restored. That's what we need to understand. That which has separated is going to be bridged. So we understand this as Adam was first created without sin. Jesus was born without sin. Okay, now I'm not going to go into the whole uh, immaculate birth of Jesus. I'll ask you to read Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 25. Okay, so what you need to understand, the Bible tells us, is that God's Holy Spirit took a seed, fertilized it, and put it into the womb of a virgin. Man had no part in that conception. So as the first Adam was created without sin, now Jesus, God in every way, Son of God, but yet man in every way, because he was born in the line of man. Put there by the Holy Spirit, conceived of God without sin. And in that mystery of birth, was born without sin. Amen. And this is something that's unique. But again, as Adam was tested in the garden and failed, 
The Bible tells us that Jesus was also tested. For the first 30 years of his life, he grew up from being a child to a boy, right, to become a man. In that 30 years, he had no power. He was like an ordinary man. He was tempted at all points. But Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 gives us such a beautiful picture. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses, our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, but was yet found without sin. Wow. This is so important. If in that 30 years Jesus lived as a man, if he could avoid sin and not sin, does it not also speak that we can also make a choice to avoid sin and be found without sin? But of course, the problem is we're already in sin <laughs> because we have been reproduced in sin. So there was a need, therefore, and a need to, for Jesus to set a pattern for us to understand. And this is the mystery of the gospel of the kingdom itself. That Bible tells us in Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 23. I'm not going to look there, but enough. You can write it down or you can, when you hear this again, note it and read it. Tells us that when Jesus was about 30 years old, he was led by the Spirit to the River Jordan. And there, he was baptized. And at his very baptism, the Spirit of God came, gentle as a dove, and indwelt him. And I want you to hear this. Jesus became the first man to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's why he said to the woman at the well, the hour has come. Because he's the first man to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And you know what the indwelling Holy Spirit does? Fantastic. Acts 10.38 tells us how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. You see, we must understand something. What you're going through right now, when there's sickness, when there's disease, when your life has become limited, let me tell you, God never created the first man, nor men, to be the, that receptacle of sin and death. God always wanted us to understand these things came because of a temptation. The temptation came because there was somebody called Satan. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Not because it's good, but I hope that gives you a revelation of your potential, of who you are, of the value that God sees in you. And very important. And yet, after now, being baptized, being filled with the Holy Spirit, there was a pattern that Jesus was to show us that we need to understand this for the new season. And you can see this in Luke chapter 4. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, Luke chapter 4 verse 1 says, full of the Holy Spirit. Was he indwelt with the Spirit? Yes. He was full of the Holy Spirit, but he was then led to the wilderness. And wilderness had to Test him again. And this is the equation we need to understand. In that testing in the wilderness, he was tempted as mankind was tempted. As Eve was tempted in the garden. With what? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Jesus was tempted with the same things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But the pattern he set for us that we need to understand is this. If you go and study this whole Luke chapter 4 from verse 1 to 12, you understand that he overcame 
the devil, not with the power of the Holy Spirit. He already full and had Holy Spirit in him. But he overcame the devil by trusting, establishing, declaring, proclaiming the word of God. Each time he said this word, it is written. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you want to make me believe. It is written. And this is important because that's the reason why the word of God went from a word that we hear to a word that was written. A word, and you must understand this. This Bible is a fantastic book. I always look at it. I know some people joke about it. say, this Bible means basic instructions before leaving earth. <laughs> I said, no. This is a book that's basic instructions before life eternal. God has eternity in His plans for you and for me. He's got an eternity beyond the mortality of this life. You know, fantastic. One of the things in New Covenant, when one day God asked me to check this out, and I actually took a concordance, I did a search on the King James Version. Do you know the word immortality appears in the Bible? The world is searching for immortality, right? A lot of other religions, they are all searching for that fountain of youth. They're searching for the thing that would make them immortal, right? They can live forever and ever. People say this world is a horrible place, but yet they want to live forever and ever here. <laughs> but God promises five times He appears in the New Testament of a mortality that is a promise to the finished work of Jesus Christ. When that happens, amen. That's something you've got to seek God for understanding. But I'll tell you this. There is a hope today of immortality and a life eternal that doesn't end when your body dies, when your body decays, because the eternity that God has for you, listen to this, is when your spirit and your soul becomes one to leave this mortal body. Amen. And I tell you this, but Jesus is saying, Understand something. But the season doesn't have to wait until the soul leaves its body. If you understand the hour that's here, you can begin to live in that spirit and in the truth right here and now. For the kingdom of God is not only to come in eternity, but the kingdom of God is right here and now. Wow, it took me a long time to process this because a lot of time for me to try to understand this. But I'm not going to preach about that today. I want to tell you something. Look at what happened. After he overcame the devil, by the power of the word, it is written. Luke chapter 4, verse 14 tells us that Jesus returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that's the difference of having the power of the Holy Spirit with us, but to be having the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. The Word of God, truth, the Word of God is truth, must be first established in our lives. The Spirit anointing doesn't come just because the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit will dwell in you. I'll talk more about it next week. But the Holy Spirit wants to come upon you. And the hour is come. And the hour is now. The prophet Isaiah says, what happened? When God will anoint you, when burdens will be lifted off, when yokes will be taken off, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing or the manifested presence of God. And I want you to hear this. The hour is not only coming, it is here and now. Amen. <clears throat> and we need to understand this a bit more. The pattern. The pattern. What is the anointing for? In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus began to talk about anointing. How the Spirit of God anointed him for a purpose. And he was quoting Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. 
But he stopped at the very words here. What was the word? The acceptable day of the Lord. Jesus has come to establish the acceptable day of the Lord. But the prophecy of Isaiah goes on. It goes on what? To bring the day of vengeance of our God. You know who continues that? The new generation in that new season who worship Him in spirit and truth. We have now been given not only the mantle, we have given a special anointing in this season. Amen. And I want to talk about it right now. So you understand this. What is this new season going to be like? Okay? Uh, next week I'll talk about how to operate in the new season. But what is this new season going to be like? Hmm, always go back to the Bible. I don't want you to share something from my own idea, my own thoughts, my own concepts. And this is important for you to understand. Be like the church in Berea. What was the church in Berea like in the times of Acts? They received the teaching of the apostles with openness of mind, readiness of mind to hear, to receive. But they understood the responsibility of searching the Scripture to establish whether it's true or not. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. That's our duty. God has given all He wants to reveal here. The Holy Spirit will give revelation. But understand, the revelation that we will have in this new season will not contradict the Word of God that's been written. And you cannot understand whether it contradicts or not unless you learn as a spiritual discipline to hear the Word of God, to read the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to internalize the Word of God, to meditate upon the Word of God, and then to live the Word of God. Amen. I hope you caught that pattern. And that's how the Word of God becomes established, not only in our hearts, becomes established as a path, as a lamb unto our feet, and a light to the very path itself. So the first thing I understood, this new era, if you've got the Bibles, you can write it down, look at it later. John chapter 14, verse 12. The first thing in this era, Jesus said, here comes the promise, I tell you. You are able to do the works that I do. You are able to do the works that I do. Do you know that made me begin to study Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? Because in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we saw how Jesus lived and walked and talked in this life. In Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four Gospels, what do you see? The Bible says Jesus did so many miracles that if we were to write it down, there's not enough books, enough to write it. But yet, the Bible in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John shows us 37 miracles. This sets the pattern for myself to begin to understand. God, if you set this pattern, so if I have the word established, I must be able to walk this pattern. And so the first verse he led me to was in John 14, 12. Verily, verily. That's the word they say. Truly, truly. <laughs> Jesus saying, I'm saying to you. means there's no doubt. I'm going to tell you something that's without doubt. I say to you what? He that believes, if you believe, on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And I like the word and conjunctive after that. He didn't stop there. He didn't say the works I do. He said and greater works. Amen. Wow. Greater works. But you notice the condition here. Greater works. Because I go to the Father. You see, that's why Jesus had to leave. That's why Jesus couldn't stay on. He could have stayed on after his resurrection. He did not be ascended, but then prophecy would not be complete. Then something would not come. But he gave me another revelation. And this is in John 14, 13. He gave us a privilege. He gave us a covenant right. He gave us the ability. Wow, I like that. To be able to ask in Jesus' name. Wow, you know, the name is so powerful because God says He's given Jesus a name that's above all names at which every knee 
in heaven and on earth shall bow. Amen. When even angels prostrate fall. Wow. 14, 13 John. And whatsoever. Do you know he didn't say only certain things? He said whatsoever. You shall ask in my name. That I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The only condition is this. That what you're asking, what Jesus do, will end in one thing. The glorifying the Father. Amen? Not for personal glorification. Not for personal needs. God cares about your needs. Don't get me wrong. But God already said, Ephesians 1, 3, He's already blessed you with all spiritual blessings in Christ. They're all yours. It's for you to understand that there are 7,487 promises in this Bible. And this is so important. And this promise is all a yes and an amen in Christ already. But understand for us to be able to partake of that. I try to teach on this. The key is worship. And Jesus is talking about that time also worship. Worship. And you know, this Bible talks or alludes to worship 8,629 times. Wow. So you see the connection between our inheritance, our destiny, worship. And you must understand, worship can be in song. Don't get me wrong. But what did Paul say? He alludes to this. We worship in spirit truth, not in music alone. In Romans 12, 1, he says, Brethren, now I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, the way you live your life, as a living sacrifice to God which is your, no, before that, which is holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Your worship must be acceptable and holy, the way you live your life. This is your act of worship. Amen. How you live your life. Don't just come Sunday and worship God and wow, I'll go away feeling good. And the moment you walk out, <laughs> that is one of the hardest things. We can read the Word. We can know the Word. But it's another thing to live the word. You see, have the flesh. And in this flesh dwells no good thing, Paul says. And the things I want to do, I don't do. Right? But the answer actually is Galatians 5. I'm going to talk about it next week. In Galatians chapter 5, he says, You not only live, walk in the spirit, you got to have life in the spirit. Yes, without a life in the spirit, you can't hope to walk in the Spirit. Yes, life in the Spirit. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. I don't get lost. Okay, the next thing he showed me was one of the things in the new era is the, what? The third thing, the gift of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father and He shall give you another comforter. Notice the word used down here in English, comforter. In the Greek word is, the word another comforter is elos parakletos. Very important. You see, in the Greek, it gives you a better dimension. The word another in English can be either elos or heteros. When, G, when Paul talks about another gospel, he uses the word heteros. What it means is this. It's another. But the word another, elos, means another about the same nature, the same character, the identical replica of Jesus. Amen. You see, man was first made in an image. The word was the muth. The muth in Hebrew means a replica, exact replica, but it's not a dead replica. A replica to replicate, to do as God would do. Now you understand why Jesus said, I can do nothing except what I see the Father do. Are we really ready to do Nothing except what God is telling us to do. I'll leave the question mark there. 
But here, important. Not only this comforter, the word comforter, parakletos is like a lawyer, the mouthpiece. He's everything. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to comfort you. Yeah. Why? And here comes a bigger promise. If you have become a believer today, He will abide with you. So sometime, for a season, the word says, no, forever. Do you know, I didn't understand it. A lot of times, we have, I call it, hymnal theology. <laughs> we we'll say, God, come and visit us. I got news for you. God doesn't want to visit you. God wants to inhabit you. Amen. God doesn't just want to come once in a while. God wants to live and abide with you forever. Okay, and but here, I show you another bigger promise. It's not only the Holy Spirit coming to you, but in John chapter 14, very next verse, verse 70, tells us that there is going to be an indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Not just a visitation. Look at these words. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. If you're not a believer, you cannot receive the Holy Spirit. Not only that, because you cannot see the Holy Spirit. Now, you all may say, I can't see the Holy Spirit. But actually, the Bible says you can see the Holy Spirit. I won't go into the seeing of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to do the seer anointing. But, amen. but enough to understand this. Neither know Him, but you know Him. If you are a believer today, it's hypocrisy. You're not a believer unless you have come to know the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, Amen. And why? Listen to these words. For He dwell with you and in you. Do you know why nobody could receive the Holy Spirit before Jesus? Because of sin, we have sinful flesh. And God cannot indwell sinful flesh. But when you accept Jesus, what happens? The righteousness of Christ is imputed upon you. Jesus does not, uh, God does not see your sins anymore. Not the original sin. We are still sinning in the flesh. But he sees Jesus. He's clothed you with righteousness. When our own righteousness is like filthy rags before God. But oh, of course, of course that's a walk of righteousness. Because the word down there, imputed, is a present continuous, caring about righteousness, not only given to you, but God is imparting righteousness to you day by day by day until you become a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord Himself. Amen? There's a perfection, there's a glory that's waiting for each and every one of us. When this mortal body doesn't constrain us anymore, Amen. I like what happened to Moses. And Moses was not yet totally redeemed. But he lived the word of God. He lived the promise of God. Listen, the Bible says, and Moses lived a full 120 years. Eyes not dim, life force not abated. Amen. I've been praying for that. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, serious. Yes. I've been praying even for restoration everywhere, even the hair. <laughs> Getting white hairs coming out. Okay. So, but praise God. I say praise God because God is able then to restore. Amen. Okay, now another thing, not only indwelling. John 14, 26 says, but the comforter, which is now identified the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Listen to what he does. He shall teach all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Wow. First condition, what did Jesus say to you? You can find the word of the Bible. The Holy Spirit can come and teach you to give you revelation, to keep you in remembrance if you have first not even read the Bible. How many of you read the Bible? You see, I want to tell you this, just reading and reading. When people say read the Bible, oh yeah, every time pastor refers to it, I read. But I'm talking reading this 
When somebody sends you a love letter, do you say, no, no, I'm going to read this part, that part? No. You've got to learn to read it from Genesis to Revelation. Amen? From Revelation backwards into Genesis. And now all these geniuses, kids, they can spell backwards. You all see that show? <laughs> but we all must be able to read the Bible forwards and backwards. Amen. Okay, another thing. Not only a counter. You know, the sixth revelation, the era that God showed me, is in John 15, 15. I'm only going to touch on nine. There are a lot more things in the new era, but just on nine things. John 15, 15 says something, that you're called not just to be a servant, but to be a friend. You may not appreciate what it means. Listen, he said, henceforth, henceforth means from here onwards, means from the moment onwards. Henceforth what? Wow. I call you not servants. For the servant know not what the Lord does. Right? You have a servant, you do not necessarily have to reveal everything to your servant, what you don't do. But I've called you friends. Listen to the power of this. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made it known to you. If you're a friend of Jesus, God already showed the Old Testament, would I do anything without first telling my friend Abraham? Jesus saying here, I will tell you all things. That's why 1 John 2.20 says, you can have an unction from the Holy Spirit and you can know all things. Somebody say, Amen. God doesn't want you to go bungling down in uncertainty, confusion. God is the author of faith. God wants you to know what you're doing and what God is calling you to do. Okay, very quickly. Another one. Number seven of this. You have been chosen and ordained for a purpose. And in John chapter 15, verse 16, what's that purpose? Now listen to these words. You have not chosen me. I thought we chose God. God says, you have not chosen me. Not only that. You know what Jesus said? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Look around. I want you to understand. Each of you have been chosen by God. But whether you do it or enter to what God has is whether you choose to answer the call. I'll repeat this again. Many may be called, but few are chosen. There's a different context to understand this. But here, he says, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you. And, hear the word, not only chose you, but ordained you. You know, when I read that, I hear the words that Jesus said, I mean, that God said to the prophet, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I already know you. Before you were birthed out from your mother's womb, I already have ordained you. I have a plan for you. And understand through a prophet, he said, and the plans of good and not evil plan to give you hope in the future. But why are we not walking in the plans of God in the hope in the future? Now, that's another thing. But listen to this. That you shall go and bring forth Fruit, and the fruit will remain. You see, God has called you. God has called me. God has chosen you. God has chosen me. God has ordained you, and God has ordained me for a purpose. God demands faithful, fruitfulness from your life. I want you to hear this. God demands, not only expect, He demands fruitfulness from your life. He didn't pay the price so that you can be enjoying your life in this world. He wants you to be fruitful. And not only that, the fruit should remain. And listen to this again. And whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, He will give it to you. Wow. Do you understand what Jesus is saying? Let's move to eight. But Holy Spirit not only wants to help you, ordain you, but the Holy Spirit wants to bring you Gifts and fruits. Now, I don't have time to teach that, but the Bible speaks of some 27 gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
27. But we always focus on the first Corinthians 12, which is only nine ministry gifts. But there's 27 gifts. My study has shown 27, maybe more. But definitely 27 gifts. And not only the gift of the Holy Spirit, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you know, one fruit, nine flavors. And the nine flavors are to help you become the man or woman of God that God wants you to be. And the next thing, number ninth, the Holy Spirit is here to empower you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You see, the Holy Spirit is in you. But yet the word God talks about the Holy Spirit wanting to come upon you to empower you. Okay, I won't teach this today. But enough to understand this. Just nine. I just gave nine. There are a lot more if you study the Word of God. Just nine things that God wants you to begin to see of yourself in this new era when the hour has come. A new perspective of what God wants to raise you up to be in the new season. So the conclusion I want to say is this. What do you want to do in response? It's true. What do you do in response? Because it's so important. Because the Bible says the Father seeks for such. How many know that you're not only chosen, you're not ordained? The Father is seeking for you right now. That you can truly live the life He wants. That you can truly worship Him in spirit and truth. And I want to close with this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 19. If you've got your Bible, turn there. And although I close this session, we shall continue the next week. In 2 Corinthians, understand in a new season right now, in verse 5. Verse 16 starts with, Wherefore, wherefore is about a therefore. <laughs> wherefore is about a time right now, a conclusion. Because of something before, you have now come to a wherefore. Then, henceforth, is going forward. So it's not about just now reaching a season and a time, but it's moving forward in a season and time. He says, going forward, you're not going to know man just after the flesh. Wow. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been given a new spirit. You're alive in the thing of spirit. Okay? Yeah, though you have known Christ after the flesh. We look at Christ as he lived in this world, in the flesh. But what he says, yet now, henceforth, again, henceforth, going forward, we know him no more. It means we cannot see him anymore in the flesh. Therefore, conclusion again, although you cannot see him in the flesh, if any man be in Christ, okay, circle the word in Christ. I won't tell you this. If you're a believer today, are you not in Christ? You're already in Christ. You're heir to the 7,487 promises of the Bible. But he says, if any man be in Christ, understand, you are a new creature. That is the old King James Version. A new creation. A new person. Altogether new. All things are passed away. All things have become new. And all things are new is what? All things are of God because God has reconciled us to Him through Jesus Christ. And as Jesus brought us back to God through the shedding of blood, through the redemption, through salvation, He's justified us. He's made us to be righteousness. Understand this. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. As we are reconciled with God, we are now going to be reconciled with people around us. It's true. You can't be reconciled to God if you are still upset at people who have hurt you. <laughs> if you are still angry. Because you embrace the ministry of reconciliation by working in that ministry of reconciliation. Amen? Now, Understand this, verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ. Actually, God was in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Correct? Reconciling the world unto himself, not 
imputing their trespasses. It means not judging us based on our wrongdoings, our sins and everything else. Okay, understand this. Not that. But it committed us to the word of reconciliation. The word became flesh and dwelt among men. And we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. I want to tell you this. We already beheld Jesus. And as we beheld Jesus, so what happened? That's the word reconciliation for us. As we are reconciled to God, we have to be reconciled then to the things around us. Next word. Now then. Now means immediately. Now then. We are ambassadors of Christ. Can you look at somebody and say no choice? <laughs> if you are in Christ, you are an ambassador for Christ. Means what? And then what does the ambassador do? The ambassador represents the country he comes from. Do you know that in this world today, you represent God. How the world sees God today is how they see you as an ambassador. Wow. As true God did beseech you, I by us. He said, I'm begging you now, understand something. We pray that in Christ's state, you be reconciled. A lot of times we ourselves don't recognize that we have been reconciled to God. And he said, you do not know the price. You know what's the price of being reconciled to God? He made Jesus sin. Jesus who knew no sin to be sin that we can become the righteousness of God. This is a key word in closing. We have been giving, given a ministry of reconcili- reconciliation through being reconciled to God. Understand that in reconciliation, God did not impute the punishment and judgment that we deserve. But instead, He's made us ambassador at a great price for Him. That we can be ambassadors of God because we are no longer separated from God right now. We are no longer separate God right now. And the greatest privilege of any believer in this new season is that God has made the way open that we can come into the Holy of Holies to be before His very throne of grace and mercy to be even able to find grace and mercy in our times of need. Amen. Challenge for you. Go back and reflect on what I've shared and ask yourself, God, not wherefore that I've learned, but henceforth I'm going to go. And therefore, I'm going to be truly that new creation in you. Let's quieten our hearts. Father, I thank you that the hour that cometh is now. We thank you for Jesus who was without sin, who in total obedience went to the cross to die for our sin. He was made sin so that we can be righteous before you. So we want to understand even today as we conclude this time what you've called us to be. And to understand the great price you've paid. I thank you, God, for the anointing that we can be truly able to stand as ambassadors for you, Lord. Awesome responsibility. But yet... It's you who will strengthen us. It's you who will equip us. It's you, Lord, who will enable us. So we give you glory, give you thanks in this time. Let the word be spirit, the word be truth. The word begin to indwell us, Lord, that we can behold 
in our lives going forward. The glory of Jesus, full of grace and truth. So Father, I give you thanks even right now. In Jesus' name.